People share their creepiest and scariest paranormal thing they've seen. Like and subscribe or I'll haunt you tonight. Back around 2014 to 2015, my grandfather, whom I was very close to, was diagnosed with a very rapid onset of dementia. Of course, he was heavily medicated and depressed and he slept most of the time. When he wasn't asleep, he would have episodes as the doctor called them. He would become very confused and start talking to objects or people in the room that were not there. He had such a lonely ghostly look in his eyes. I was homeschooled at the time and spent most of my time at his house helping take care of him with my grandmother. She vowed to never put him in a nursing home and she never did. I watched him spiral down. I helped my grandmother calm him most nights when he was ballistic. A house once filled with light became a very dark place to be. The first Christmas he was sick, I was home with my family for a few days. Behind our house is what we call the old house. It was my father's childhood home that we built our house in front of. We gutted the old house and made it into a shed where we kept overflow junk and seasonal things. My mother had sent my sister and me out to the old house to grab some rubber made boxes that contained our Christmas tree and all of our decorations. The old house has a door on the front you can enter to easily access the rooms containing our storage. At the end of the house, there are two openings in the wall for cars, we set it up like a garage. It was late evening and that grey December haze was hanging in the air, I could see my breath. The old house has always been eerie to me. I opened the door, stepped in and went to grab the boxes. My sister waited outside the open door frame. I grabbed the box containing the tree first as it was readily available. I turned to walk back down the hall towards the door. Directly across the garage were the two garage door openings. They were open and I could see out into the yard. As I carried the box down the hall, my eyes caught a glimpse of something, that's when I saw it. I was startled, I gasped as the air left my body. It was a moment of pure fear and confusion. I froze in my tracks and literally dropped the box onto the cement floor, my mouth dropped open. My sister quickly adapted the contagious fear, even though she had not seen what I had just seen. What? What is it E? She asked, panicked. I couldn't answer, I can't explain why, other than the fact that I was just so deep in disbelief, but I began walking towards the garage door. I picked up pace, wanting to catch whatever the hell I had just seen as it ran away. My sister followed behind me, scared to be alone. As I cleared the opening and turned the corner to view the backyard, I saw nothing, it was gone. Now, I was even more frightened. I doubted myself and I questioned myself. Surely I had just spooked myself right? Then again, our backyard is a field. If I had just seen a person, there would have been no logical way they could have disappeared and nowhere for them to hide in that short amount of time. My sister and I ran inside, I told my mom, I'm sure you all know how that goes. I kept closing my eyes trying to remember what I had just seen, the details, the features. But that was the thing, there were no predominant features. No eyes, no nose, no hands or fingers. The only thing I could remember was this, the featureless figure was cloaked in a tattered, black, cloak-like drape. I couldn't make sense of this, until I google shadow people online. After only a few mere seconds of scrolling through images of this new-to-me phenomenon, I saw it. Apparently, some have seen it before. Ever since that day, my sister, my cousin, and I, who share a very close spiritual bond, continued to see dark figures running around the shadows of our lives. We saw all kinds of them in many places at each other's houses. But, the one place we saw them the most, my grandmother's house. We speculated and often wondered how this was connected to my grandfather's illness. We often wondered if ghosts or spirits were more active in this dark depressing home. The worst night we ever experienced there is something I will never forget. It was 3 AM, we were all asleep. It had been days since my grandfather had been awake and active. We three slept in the same room on bunk beds and a couch. A comforting silence was shattered when my grandmother screamed my name out into the night. I quickly jumped off of the couch and ran into the living room where my grandfather and grandmother were. My cousin followed behind me. My grandfather was fully dressed, for the first time in probably six months. He had on his hat, glasses and he had his cane. My grandmother was pulling him away from the door as he struggled to get it open. He was trying to leave. We all tried to calm him, but we also knew he could possibly hurt us out of confusion. We tried our hardest, but he was a huge man. The front door had three glass panes in it, covered by a curtain. 
He pulled the curtain back, cupping his hands around his eyes, and looked into the dark, enclosed front porch on the other side. Help us, we're trapped, there's no way out of here, we have to get out, he cried. My grandmother hysterically asked him, who are you calling for bud, you're home, this is home. I'm talking to that little boy out there. He's just staring at me, he won't open the door. We're not going to make it out. We were all consumed with fear. We knew he was just confused, but it still gave us chills. We couldn't help but continuously look over our shoulders. After a moment of panic, he rushed past us again. He went into his pitch black dark room, picked up his phone, and dialed a number. Mom, mom, you gotta help me, we are trapped in the house, he yelled. His mom had been dead for over two years and his phone was disconnected from the outlet. My grandmother rushed into the kitchen to call 911 and we followed her. That was when I saw a white cloudy like figure literally pass through the dining room and into our bedroom. It was at least 20 inches off the floor, and its head was through the ceiling, it didn't float. It was moving as though it was injured or limping. I rushed back into the kitchen, stumbling into my grandmother, cousin and sister, terrified. Later that night, while waiting for the ambulance, he looked me dead in the eye and said, they're over there and pointed behind me, towards the dark hall. I never went back to sleep that night. He passed away in 2015. In my memory, I have not seen a shadow person since. We see them occasionally out of the corners of my eyes. But they do not feel malevolent as they did before. I have never since felt so connected to the spirit world and I have never felt darkness linger so long. When my daughter was a teenager, we were in the living room watching TV. I had a bay window right next to the front door where I kept my keys. One night, we were watching TV and the keys had been on the windowsill for hours. There was no way they could fall. Suddenly, the keys literally leapt from the windowsill and landed on the floor at least a foot away from the location of the window. It was impossible for them to suddenly fall, and even if they had simply fallen, they would have landed nearer to the window. My daughter and I just looked at each other, shrugged, and carried on watching the TV. I lived alone in a first floor flat after my kids grew up and left home. I was happy there and the flat had a peaceful vibe. A friend of a friend called himself a medium and offered to conduct a seance in my home. I agreed for some reason. This wouldn't have been unusual, because my friends and I were into many spiritual and esoteric things at the time. I can't remember anything unusual or remarkable about the seance itself, so suffice to say, nothing happened at the time. However, the vibe in my flat began to change. There was a heavy oppressive atmosphere, there were warm and hot spots and visitors noticed the change in the vibe. One night, I was alone, watching TV. To my left, I heard the distinct chirping of a small bird and could hear little wings. The invisible bird seemed to land on a plant, which moved. My cat heard the bird and ran to the plant, hissing loudly. I kept this experience to myself and went to visit my friends who'd been at the seance. The so-called medium was there too, I didn't like his energy. While we were in her home, a lampshade shook and we could all hear the distinct sound of a small bird landing on it. I had other occurrences too, and the vibe in my flat became so oppressive, I eventually moved. Just after my brother died, music equipment would switch itself on, playing music my brother knew I liked. His favorite food was apple pies, and two days after his death, we were in a private hire taxi, a small car. The driver had to open the window because he said there was a strong aroma of apple pie as we entered the taxi. None of us had been anywhere in apple pie. There were other tangible experiences too. All my birth family of origin is now dead, and Paul has made his presence known on many occasions, more than any other relative. This story is true, it involves my immediate family and the house I grew up in in a city in Connecticut. Before I was born, my parents were living with my older sister and brothers in an apartment in New Britain, Connecticut. They had become too large of a family for the apartment, and my father decided the time was right to look for a house. The year was 1978 and he had just gotten a promotion at his job and the money allowed for a down payment on a colonial he found nearby. The house was built in 1920 and was affordable. Best of all it had a large backyard, a finished walk-up attic, a large basement, and room enough for everyone. It was January 1979 when they finally moved in. The family settled in and my older brothers and sister were happy with their rooms. One night, not long after moving in the strange happening started. 
My father was laying in bed one night when he heard footsteps going up and down the staircase from the first floor living room to the second floor where the bedrooms were. He thought nothing of it, because my sister at the time had been a bit of a night owl at the age of 14, and would wander around at night. The funny part was that the footsteps when they reached the top of the stairs, would stop at each door to each room then go back down the stairs again. This seemed odd to my father, but he said that at the time he didn't feel like investigating, he fell asleep. That same night, my mother awoke sometime after my father had fallen asleep. She too heard the sound of footsteps coming up the staircase and stopping at each door. She looked toward the door to their bedroom and saw what she describes as a figure of a woman in blue. My mother describes the sensation of being frozen and breaking out in a cold sweat. The figure spoke and said, do you know where Margaret is? My mother could not answer and before long the figure dissolved. The next morning, my parents swapped stories. My father recounted the footsteps and my mother told her a much more disturbing story. A few weeks went by and my mother was speaking with her father, my grandpa, and she told him her story. Being the type of man he was, he told my mom the story was crap and probably just a dream. This discussion they had is integral to what will happen later on. Strange things would happen in the house. Old shades would go up on their own. Footsteps, music in the attic with no known source, pictures would come off walls. Just things that would remind you that there may be a presence as you started to let your guard down. Sort of like a hey remember me thing. Let's fast forward a couple of years to the night of September 30th, 1981. My parents were at the hospital because my mother was in labor with me. My grandparents were watching my siblings that night at the house. The same grandpa who had dismissed my mother's claims was asleep on the couch in the living room. Later that night, he awoke to the sound of what he calls the noise a dress makes when swaying. He looked up to see a woman in blue gliding across the living room and then up the staircase to the second floor. When he saw my mother in the hospital when they visited her and newborn me, he said one simple phrase and never spoke of it again. He stooped down to her and said, I believe you now, that was it, just those words. He recounted his story sometime later to her. We lived in that house for 17 more years. Strange things would always occur. The ghost, who we nicknamed Margaret would let us know she was still there. We never felt threatened. In fact, I fondly remember that home is warm and welcoming and loving with a hint of added creepiness. Again, nothing demonic or harmful. Doors would open, cats would hiss at nothing, we would see figures out of the corner of our eye darting up the stairs. The smell of cigar smoke would fill the living room yet no one in our family smoked. Sometime before we moved, we got a knock on the door. A woman was standing there and said she was someone who had lived in the home. She was the daughter of the family my father bought the house from. She asked if she could see the house so as to revisit her childhood, my parents allowed it. While going through the house, she would touch doorways in a loving manner and tear up as she walked through the kitchen and living room. After that, she sat with my parents for a cup of coffee and she asked something that I will always remember to this day. She said, by the way, have you seen her? We all knew who her was. Then the story started coming out about her time in the house and the visions of a woman in the attic window and footsteps. It was nice to have more verification. Thank you for listening to my story. I don't look back on these things with fear, but only with fondness and a good feeling inside. My parents are elderly now and we all still recount our time in that warm yet haunted home in Connecticut. When I was in high school, I had a friend that had passed away. Soon after his passing, many of my friends asked if I had any ghostly visitation from him because they were seeing him and experiencing strange things. I told them no, and was weirded out by what they had said. That night, my auntie had asked me to babysit at her apartment. I, knowingly that my deceased friend had lived on the top floor was not bothered by it, but focused on getting paid. Later that night, I had put the kids to sleep turned off all the lights and called it a night. Watching TV, comfortably laying on the living room couch, with a throw blanket on. As I was starting to fall asleep, I heard footsteps coming from the bedroom and into the dark hallway. It gently progressed into loud footsteps because it was getting closer, but as soon as it was about to reach the TV light, nothing, nothing came out. By the fourth or fifth time of sitting up and seeing nothing, I was fed up and ignored it. I came to the conclusion that it just, maybe the people upstairs were just using the bathroom frequently, at 1 AM, so, I ignored it and tried to catch some Z's. Suddenly, I heard the noise of a plastic cup being thrown onto the kitchen floor with force and anger, literary bouncing all over violently. Startled and frightened, 
I finally put two and two together and remembered what my friends was trying to explain to me earlier that day. I threw the blanket over my head and my eyes closed tight. Just when I thought it was over, I heard a voice mumbling incoherently behind my head. I heard it as clear as day. Now I have the blanket over my head, eyes closed, and hands over my ears. I don't know how long I was under the blanket, all I know was that as soon as my auntie stepped foot into the apartment, I was gone. After that experience, I'm not sure what to make of it. I never heard or saw anything strange, never even had one dream of him. Everything just went quiet after that, I was quite baffled by it. Guess he wanted to go out with a bang. This incident has opened up my eyes to something more after death, maybe it is something that is not meant for the living to understand. I think one will only know what becomes of us when our time is up. The dead is not meant for the living to know, they only go bump in the night. For a very short time, I lived in a haunted house which was my family's house. I was raised by my maternal grandparents, my mom still going to college when she had me. My grandfather built the house for my grandmother back in the 60s. He acquired many of the material from a hospital that burned down. Nothing ever happened in the house until my husband and I were ready to move out after I received an inheritance from my grandparents. The house was big, 36 by 40, and had a finished basement with a bachelor. My husband and I had the first level while my great aunt, grandfather's sister, lived in the bachelor in the basement. Our living room was just above her bedroom. Because it was an open space, the dining room area was above her living room. One night, my husband and I were watching television and we were hearing humming. We obviously thought it was my great aunt, because the voice sounded exactly like hers. Then, not long after, I heard my name. Often, when my great aunt had something to tell me or wanted to ask something, she would come in the basement's entrance which was below the kitchen and I would hear her very well. I answered, nothing. My husband asked me to call her again, nothing. Then, when I was about to sit in the couch, I hear my name a second time. I went downstairs and knocked on her door, nothing, I was worried. I thought maybe she fell down or something happened, nothing. I climbed up the stairs and decided to go see in the kitchen window overviewing the driveway and like I suspected, no cars except my husband's. Just before I was about to let him know he said, hey, isn't tonight her great aunt's bingo night? We heard more humming, but not my name. When my great aunt was back, I asked her if she sang or called me and she of course answered, no, I was out playing bingo, I left around 4. It happened between 8 p.m. and 11 p.m., no one else in the house. Nothing was malicious, but because I had never lived in a haunted place, it was enough to have my curiosity picked. One thing for sure, I won't forget it. My grandmother knew a neighbor lady who had been a ballerina in her youth. The lady lived alone in a modest house, and her pride and joy was the flower garden she kept in a tiny plot in her front yard. Every day, my grandmother would drive past the neighbor lady's house, and would see her out in the yard, wearing a sun hat and kneeling as she tended the flowers. The lady would wave and my grandmother would wave back. That was the whole extent of their interaction for many years. One day, my grandmother learned from a mutual friend that the neighbor lady had become quite ill, and was confined to her bed. My grandmother asked if she could help, and was told some relatives of the lady were coming in every day to take care of her, and that she was receiving no visitors. Grandma still drove past the house every day, and it saddened her that she no longer saw her friend tending the flowers as she had done in the past. After a month had passed, my grandmother was driving past the lady's house one day, and saw a familiar figure in the garden. It was the neighbor lady, kneeling and tending the flowers just as she had done before her illness. The lady turned and waved, and grandma waved back. She was about to pull over and get out to talk to the lady, when all of a sudden, a strange feeling came over her, and she had a strong instinct that she should just keep driving until she got home. When she entered the house, the message light on the phone was flashing. It was the mutual friend, who had called to inform her that the neighbor lady had died the previous evening. I experienced unexplainable things as a child in the family home at the time. Experiences that I still have very vivid memories of to this very day, 44 years after the events. I do not want to bore you with unnecessary information relating to the period, but I will briefly outline the house layout as relative to the subject. From my birth in 1971, and until 1976, we lived in a semi-detached two-story house on Southfields Avenue, Stan Ground Peterborough. It was nothing spectacular and of typical British layout, lounge, dining area and kitchen on the ground floor, 
Two bedrooms and a bathroom on the upper floor. The main feature of the house was a vertical striped glass partition that ran the full length of the stairway, plasterboard wall from floor level to just above the stair treads, then glass to ceiling, on the lower level. This would allow you to see anyone coming down or going up the stairs, and would make them appear distorted due to the stripe effect. It was always funny to watch. We had a three-seater sofa against the bottom wall of the stairs, I will reference this as 12 o'clock where my parents commonly sat together in the early years and a single chair at 3 and 9 o'clock. Sitting in the 9 o'clock chair, and became my usual chair to sit in, you had a view of the stairs in their entirety beyond the glass. At the top of the stairs was a small landing, with my bedroom door just off slightly to the right and in front of you, to the right of that, around the corner, was the bathroom and then right a bit more, my parents' bedroom. As you looked into the door of my parents' room, there was a large heavy dresser unit against the wall shared by the bathroom. On this, my mother used to have a white polystyrene mannequin wig or hat stand. From the earliest age I can remember, I used to see black shadows creeping around the floor of my room. They would always come in three and there was never any sound with them, no growling, no shuffling or footsteps. Although initially I remember being interested in these things at first, it got to a point where I would feel afraid, hiding under my quilt and start crying much to the annoyance of my parents who had to come in at all hours to comfort me. I can't remember exactly how long this lasted, but I do remember that it stopped as suddenly as it started. Things, visually, settled down for a while although other strange things were starting to happen around the house. Strange noises, things being moved all the time, which I was usually blamed for. The main item of interest was my mother's wig or hat stand. This was constantly being moved, especially whilst we were out of the house even with my parents ensuring doors were closed throughout. I remember we went to Hunston one day for a treat trip. On returning, we found the stand in the center of the dining table. My mother was adamant that she had left it in their room, and the bedroom and stairway doors were all shut. When I turned four, and now with a little sister in the house sharing my room, things took another turn. She would wake at night, screaming and seeming very distressed. She does not, nor has ever recollected anything unusual but I often wondered if they had returned. Occasionally, sitting in my 9 o'clock chair in the early evening during the winter months, and when getting dark early, I would see a figure moving up and down the stairs. Now, the stairway would get illuminated from the TV, which faced the glass partition, whilst it was on and you could clearly distinguish the lightly colored wall behind the glass. This figure was approximately the height of a child and certainly wasn't as tall as an adult. It would come down and stop, before coming down a bit further, before stopping again and so on until it had reached the bottom of the stairs, and stood behind the glass door at the foot of the stairs which lead into the lounge. Then it would repeat, heading back up the stairs to the upper floor, pausing on occasions. I remember telling my parents about this on more than one occasion, but as usually is, it was dismissed as an overactive mind or shadows cast from the TV, which I can categorically say now, that it was not. It was not a normal light shadow, it had a slight definition and obscured the light traveling between the glass and the stairway back wall. Things came to a head in the summer of 1976, a few months before my parents divorced and we left the property with my father. We were all in the lounge area. My father was sat on the sofa near the stairway door, my mother at the other end of the sofa near the kitchen. My sister was in her bouncer on the floor and I was in my trusted 9 o'clock chair. I want to say it was midday, but not certain about that, but it was daytime and there was lots of light in the house from the windows. We were all watching something on TV when something caught my attention moving at the top of the stairs, viewable through the glass partition. I did not recognize what this thing was at first. It was not until the object started floating down the stairway, a short distance above the treads, that I recognized it instantly. It was my mother's wig or hat stand. It continued down to about midpoint of the stairs before turning towards the lounge, and I swear to this day, it was looking right at me with those lifeless eyes. I was petrified, I wanted to call out to my parents, but was literally frozen with fear. I tried to turn away from its gaze, but again, I could not. We stayed locked in this unnatural staring competition for what seemed like an eternity before it turned back and floated back out of view. I screamed, my parents, instantly shocked, jumped up and rushed over to me as my sister started crying. It took them a while to calm me down and I remember pointing to the stairs where the stand had come to rest halfway down and sobbing, was there, was there, much to the confusion, and panic of my parents. My father, thinking someone was in the house, went to look upstairs. 
and a few moments later was shouting at my mum for not putting the blooming thing in its proper place, when he discovered the stand on their bed, its head resting on my mum's pillow. Once again, she was adamant that it was on the dresser when she had come down earlier that day. I never experienced anything like it again after leaving the property. Although I have had a minor incident at another property I lived in with my father, sister and stepfamily years after, and actually had a dream about only a couple of years back, which is really strange for me, I am not a dreaming kind of person. And I have spent many years contemplating if what I experienced was real at all. I have no evidence other than my memory, feelings and senses at that time. The fact that I can recollect this period with such clarity presents the real possibility of a trauma memory, suggesting that this was something I experienced and not a fabrication of an overactive mind, despite my age at the time.